Hello, Honors U.S. History students. Um, today's uh, video lecture notes are going to be on World War II. So we're going to have some stuff with battles and we're going to review some things from the home front that were highlighted in your web quest. All right, so take a pause right now and get out a pencil and paper so you can follow along. All right, let's get started. All right, so we got our first slide here. This is a slide you saw before, and it is a review of how the war in Europe got started. So with the war in Europe is everything kind of goes back to the Treaty of Versailles that ended World War I. Um, that treaty was meant to punish the Germans for that war. Um, and because of the political and economic turmoil that happened in Germany is that the German people will elect Hitler in 1933 just because they're super desperate for somebody who might have some good ideas to try and help them out. Um, Europe wants to avoid war at all possible, and so they adopt this idea of appeasement, which is basically giving in to somebody consistently just to avoid war at all costs. So again, they're really desperate too. Right? When people are very desperate, they make poor decisions. Um, the war gets started in Europe officially when Germany invades Poland, right? and then the Allies will declare war against Germany. Remember, this is not when the U.S. is involved yet. The U.S. will get involved with the attack on Pearl Harbor, right? For this one, you do need to know the date, all right? December 7th, 1941, quote, a date which will live in infamy, right? So on this particular day, uh, the Japanese will uh, attack Pearl Harbor, which is in Hawaii, right? And they attack this particular location because they're angry over an oil embargo that the U.S. put on the Japanese. An embargo is a stoppage of all trade. Um, this particular um, attack will destroy most of the Pacific fleet um, and then officially the U.S. will declare war on Japan after this. Um, anytime you see any of these YouTube links or videos throughout um, our video today, these are all going to be linked in the description down below. Feel free to click on those. There are going to be lots of videos. There are going to be trailers for movies and stuff like that, so definitely you could go and watch those movies later on to give you a little bit of background information and help you out a little bit um, while you're you're finishing some of your assignments. Um, also, we are going to see lots of images, uh, cartoons that are from uh, somebody really familiar to you guys. So this is from Dr. Seuss, um, and we're going to see lots of Dr. Seuss cartoons um, throughout different things that we'll see here and there. All right, so we're going to start off in the European front, and so we're going to kind of go between Europe and the Pacific. Now, most of our stuff, we're going to focus on the Pacific side of the war because that is where the United States is going to be involved in the most. Um, we are not going to be involved in the European front as, um, as much as um, we are the Pacific. Also with this is that we're going to focus on just the mere, mere basics because we've got to kind of pare things down since we are digitally learning, right? So the turning point of the war in Europe is going to be D-Day, which is in June of 1944, right? D-Day is an invasion of the shores of France, which is in Normandy, right? And so with this turning point in the war, it's going to create it where the Allies are now going to start being winning. And the Allied commander of this invasion is Dwight D. Eisenhower. So in this picture down below, you can see Eisenhower here talking with his troops. Um, Eisenhower does such a good job with this that he will very easily win election for, pres uh, for the presidency in the 1950s. Right? And again, these two links here for different things that are going on are going to be in the description down below. Um, this one in particular is going to be a clip from the movie Saving Private Ryan which if you feel free to go ahead and watch that, go ahead and do that. Um, a quick thing with uh, that particular movie is the first about 30 minutes of the movie are a really good in-depth look at the invasion of D-Day. And um, it is done so accurately that when Steven Spielberg made the movie and showed it, um, had a showing to a bunch of uh, veterans who were survivors of the invasion of Normandy, a lot of them were not able to watch the entire section of the film because they said it was too realistic. Um, so it does really kind of put us in that perspective of what was going on. Um, so uh, definitely something you could watch, but also definitely warnings on that because um, of its intensity of what's going on. Right. Okay, um, also in Europe here, um, before the war is over, um, a lot of the allies are going to be getting together and uh, having a conference, the Yalta Conference. This might be familiar from world history from last year, right? And so this is where we're gonna have the three, big three are gonna meet, which is going to be the United States, the Soviet Union, and Great Britain. So in our picture here, we have Stalin from the Soviet Union, we have FDR from the United States, and we have Churchill from Great Britain, right? Um, notice they are all sitting down because remember, FDR has Poland 
polio and so he's not his legs don't work very well and so they're all going to be sitting down whenever you see pictures of these gentlemen um, so these guys are going to be coming up with the plan for what's going to happen after the war now the war isn't over in Europe until April so they're uh, meeting quite early and so it's showing us that they really understand the war is almost over it's just a kind of a matter of days um, which in this case is a, just a few months um, and one of their plans is to divide Germany into four different zones after the war to stop a dictatorship from coming about again um, and again this is the idea to learn from their mistakes from the first world war because they didn't break up Germany enough um, they did break up Austria so definitely something that's going on. Um, a little side note of something funny is that um, Stalin over here, the dictator of the Soviet Union, actually made sure he was sitting on a pillow because he wanted to make sure he was not uh, shorter than FDR or Churchill. So he made sure he was tall enough um, in order to do that because, you know, that's what dictators do. <laughs> all right, um, to end the war in Europe, all right, um, we have our dates here in April and May. All right, so um, in April, Mussolini, who is the dictator of Italy, and Hitler, the dictator of Germany, are both going to die in April. Um, and so with their deaths, um, the war is going to be over. This is also going to be with the fall of Berlin, or sometimes it's considered the Battle of Berlin. Um, but there wasn't a lot of fighting happening because the Germans were surrendering. So not really a battle, but more of a fall. Um, and so when this invasion of Berlin happens. The Soviets will enter it on the western, uh, on the eastern half, and the Americans on the western half, and that's where we're going to start seeing the division of uh, Germany itself and the division of Berlin, which later on then you're going to have that Berlin Wall that's going to divide that city, um, and it's divided on the eastern and western halves um, based on these two countries invading. Right. Um, the official end of the war um, for Europe is in May of 1945. All right. And so that's VE Day or Victory in Europe Day. Um, this is when the uh, American soldiers, for the most part, and um, you're also going to have Soviet soldiers, are going to uh, liberate the concentration camps that are throughout uh, Germany and Poland and a bunch of other locations throughout the middle part of Europe. Um, when they see all of these things, people knew that there was concentration camps, but they didn't know the extent of what was going on in those particular camps. Or um, like from world history, you guys definitely have talked about the concentration camps and the Holocaust much more than we are going to cover here. Um, but again, the Americans and the Soviets, we knew that there was camps there, but we didn't know of what was considered the final solution and what was going on. Um, that was very, very shocking. Uh, one of the things that happened with this is that uh, President Eisenhower, so remember, he's going to be president later, but at this point, he's just a general. He makes sure that there are um, video cameras throughout the camps to record what they're seeing and people taking pictures to record the information of what they found to make sure that people could never say that this was um, a false narrative, that this didn't happen. So um, even at that particular time, people like Eisenhower realized how important it was for people to see what was really going on in those particular locations. All right. Um, at this particular point, though, we are still fighting the war in, with Japan in the Pacific. And also in April is when FDR has died of a brain aneurysm. Um, he dies in April. Actually, it was um, the anniversary was yesterday. The 12th of April was when he died. And so in the middle of this war, we now have to have a new president. And that new president is going to be Harry Truman. Okay, so let's move on to the Pacific, all right? So what is happening over there? All right, so we're gonna look at a map first. We are gonna do a couple readings throughout this because again, we wanna focus more on the Pacific since the United States is going to be um, basically told to take care of Japan mostly on their own. So when we look at our map here, Right, we have this solid uh, yellow line. This is how far the Japanese have expanded and taken over all of these lands. In here, the United States owned the Philippines, right? So that has been taken from the United States. Guam is also in here. It's such a small island, you can't see it on the map, um, but that is also owned by the United States. These are being taken over by the Japanese. Um, and they actually, the plan, all right, Yamamoto is the general of uh, Japan. His plan is to go out to where this dotted line is, right? And on this dotted line, we have the island of Midway. Midway is going to be owned by the United States. And then uh, obviously their plan is to take over Midway and then 
obviously Hawaii, and then keep going towards the continental United States. They're also going to try to take over some of the Aleutian Islands, which is in this long um, archipelago chain that is part of Alaska. All right, so we got some geography stuff happening here. Um, so again, for these battles, we are going to uh, look at different things, but we are also going to do a little bit of reading here. So I'm going to read for you guys and just kind of follow along. Um, and again, this is just because we need to have a little bit more background on these particular topics for the Pacific. All right. So the midway is the island because it's midway across the Atlantic. And also it is midway as a turning point in the war in the Pacific. So it's an easy way to help us remember midway is that turning point because it's midway through the war. All right. So we have Admiral Yamamoto, commander of the Japanese forces in the Pacific knew that the United States Navy was still a powerful threat. Before the Americans could retaliate for Pearl Harbor, Yamamoto sought to destroy American aircraft car carriers in the Pacific. He turned his attention to Midway, an American naval base in the Central Pacific that was vital to the defense of Hawaii. Losing Midway would force American defenses back to the California coast. Yamamoto's ambitious plan entailed taking Midway and establishing a military presence in the Aleutians, a string of islands off the coast of Alaska. What Yamamoto did not realize was that Admiral Chester Nimitz, commander of the United States Navy in the Pacific, knew the Japanese plans. Navy codebreakers had intercepted Japanese messages. To meet the expected assault, Nimitz sent his only available aircraft carriers to Midway. The Japanese Navy was stretched out across most of a thousand miles from the Aleutians to well west of Midway. American forces were all concentrated near Midway. All right, so the Japanese are all over the place. The United States is concentrated in one location. All right. The Japanese commenced their attack on June 4th, 1942, in the most important naval battle of World War II. The United States dealt Jap Japan a defensive defeat. Torpedo plans and dive bombers, or torpedo planes, sorry, torpedo planes and dive bombers sank four Japanese aircraft carriers, along with all 250 aircraft on board and many of Japan's most experienced pilots. American, America lost only one aircraft carrier. The Battle of Midway was a turning point of the war in the Pacific, ending the seemingly unstoppable Japanese advance. Japan still had a powerful navy, committed troops, and fortified positions, but it would never again threaten Hawaii or Pacific domination. Japan was now on the defensive end of the war. So some quick notes on this, right? So again, the turning point of the war, part of us figuring out what they, uh, the plans were, were from these people called the Code Talkers, which were Navajo Indians that were, um, the Navajo language is not written down, it is only spoken, and it's only known by people who are Navajo. It's a very, very difficult language. So they use this language as a code. Um, this video that we're going to see in the description down below is going to be um, a trailer for the movie uh, Wind Talkers, which is about the Navajo Code Talkers. Another movie that just recently came out that might be a little harder to find, um, but you know, you might be able to find it, is um, the movie Midway. Um, it is a really, really good movie, um, does a really good job with uh, all of the different strategic parts of this battle. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, um, it's a really good movie. Um, I would say it's extremely historically accurate when I saw it. And um, unlike a lot of other war movies, it does, it's, you know, it does a very, very good job. Um, and I would highly recommend it if you have the ability to, or access to it. Okay. Um, moving on with our Pacific Front is we have the Manhattan Project. Right? The Manhattan Project is the code name for the secret um, project to create the atomic bomb. Right? Robert, Opp Robert Oppenheimer is going to be the physicist in charge of the program. He's going to um, get uh, Albert Einstein also on this program to help him out. So we know who Einstein is. Um, and Einstein, actually, when he starts developing this bomb, he writes a series of letters to FDR, right? And one of his letters, he starts off and he says, it's like, we got to use this bomb because I've seen what's happening in Germany. There's no way we're going to be able to stop Hitler. We have to use it. But then later, after they test the bomb, he sends another letter and is like, um, this thing is way more powerful than we thought it would be. Maybe, maybe we shouldn't use it, right? So even the scientists were kind of conflicted of should this bomb be used, this new weapon, or not. Um, the secret project is not in Manhattan, like the project says. It's actually in Los Alamos, New Mexico. So when we have our little map over here, Los Alamos, New Mexico is right down this way, right? Um, they're going to be testing bombs at that location, but also be testing some out in the Pacific later on. Um, 
when we have this project, we only create um, two particular bombs. Um, and so those are going to be the ones we will use on Japan to end the war. Right. Moving on to another Pacific battle, we have the Battle of Iwo Jima. Right. So Iwo Jima is a small uh, volcanic island um, outside of the main home islands of Japan. Um, and since it's a small volcanic island, no one lives there. So it's one of those things where the, first this battle doesn't quite seem like it makes sense because we fought there for over a month on this little itty bitty island that no one lives. Um, but basically what it was is it shows us that the Japanese have this strategy of fighting for the till the last man standing, right? They will never, ever, ever, ever give up, right? And so with this um, particular battle is that we're fighting for an entire month. And even when the commanders have been killed or captured, um, every single Japanese soldier will not give up until they are either killed or captured. Um, so it gives us this idea um, and th this part down here that's in stars, right? Definitely make sure you highlight that, is that we realize that if we would in we won't be able to invade Japan because um, the Japanese people are going to have the same mentality of fighting to the last man standing. Um, so it might be this idea that we need to use that ultimate weapon, that atomic bomb that we are creating, or a lot of American soldiers would die if we had an invasion. Some other terms we have in here is island hopping, right? So remember at this time period, we don't have, um, where our technology is getting better, but it's not awesome yet. And so we have to keep refueling our planes. So with that, we have to get control of several islands so we can hop from one to the next to the next F having refueling. Um, also, we start to see from this battle, that idea of people, of the Japanese people never ever giving up. Um, and we're gonna start seeing kamikaze pilots, which would be suicide pilots. Um, basically with these, particular pilots, you start to see this happening towards the end of the war as a move of desperation. Um, the idea where they are trying as best they can to try and hold off the Americans. And unfortunately, with that, um, you're going to go to some drastic or desperate measures. Right. Um, the war is going to end here. We're going to talk about both locations of bombings. All right. So we have the first bombing is in Hiroshima. Right, Hiroshima and Nagasaki are both factory cities, um, and we do warn all of the people that we are going to be dropping these bombs. Right, so here's a copy of what we dropped from airplanes, and this is a translation of it. But we told everyone what was going to happen. Um, the government of Japan said that the Americans were lying, and so the Japanese people did not evacuate those cities. Um, and so um, they don't give up after this bombing. Um, and one of the things that the Japanese are thinking of is they think, well, yeah, they bombed the city of Hiroshima, but they only have one of these bombs. So, you know, we're not, we're not going to give up. Right. So three days later, right, the United States will bomb Nagasaki. Right. And again, they didn't surrender after the first bomb because they kind of think that we're bluffing, that we're like, oh, they just have one. Um, well, we only had two. So if they call our bluff after this one, it would have taken us, you know, several months to create another one. Um, Truman is present at this time. So he had to make this decision. And again, he makes the decision not lightly at all because he realizes that you know whenever you're using some sort of new technology people are going to die but he was more concerned of saving those american lives if there was an invasion of the japanese home islands right so the war is officially over right so world war ii whole war officially over in august 15th of 1945 right victory in japan day is going to be celebrated so you have this famous uh picture here of people in times square Right. Um, so with the aftermath of the bomb, I have a little bit of stuff here. Um, so we didn't we had tested these bombs, but we had never we didn't really know how powerful they could be. Right. And so here we have some pictures of coins, metal coins and glass bottles that are fused together from that heat of the blast. And then some of you guys in uh, middle school might have read the story of Sako, uh, Sakiato and the Thousand Paper Cranes. If you haven't and you want to, um, it is actually a really good book. It's a short, short book, but it's about a uh, little girl who had survived the bombing and um, she ended up getting leukemia from the radiation afterwards. And so it's a story of how she um, heard this myth um, that if you fold a thousand paper cranes, you get one wish. 
Um, well, unfortunately, she passes away before she's able to make her thousand paper cranes. Now, um, the other picture we have here of these paper cranes is, is this is from the 9-11 memorial in New York City. So after um, the United States was attacked on 9-11, um, the children of Tokyo started making paper cranes and sent a thousand paper cranes to New York, um, and they are displayed in that museum. Um, so... Again, a really good, um, a really heartwarming tradition and that sort of thing. Um, if you go online and Google how to make a paper crane, um, there are definitely going to be instructions and totally videos and stuff like that for you guys to do that if you feel interested. All right. So our next thing we're going to do is we're going to do a real quick review of uh, some of the major po uh, points of the home front that are from your guys' uh, web quest. All right. Now, not all the things are going to be in our quick little review here, but we're going to have some. Okay. All right. So we're going to go over some things, some stuff you have seen before. So remember that we started off as the United States is isolated, and then we entered the war after Pearl Harbor, right? And when we enter this war, we're going to start war mobilization. We saw the same thing in World War I. So all of our factories are going to start producing war goods. So like um, Henry Ford and the Ford factory are not going to produce cars anymore. They're going to be producing airplanes. Um, and FDR is going to call us the great arsenal of democracy. What that means is that we are this giant group of people that are trying to uh, defend democracy by creating weapons. Okay, so remember an arsenal is a uh, stockpile of weapons. Uh, we're gonna be rationing tons of food, and so with that, we're going to be creating victory gardens. So people are gonna be making gardens in their homes. Some other things we're gonna be rationing here all right, we have some different pictures going on. So here they're car, uh, carpooling. So they're sharing uh, gas, conserving gas. Here they are saving kitchen fat because that can be used for bombs and bullets. Um, down here we have some pictures of some ladies that they um, traditionally women would wear uh, pantyhose or stockings. However, that material was being used to make parachutes. So these ladies are making it look like they're wearing these fancy stockings by putting this makeup on their legs and drawing the seam on the back of their legs legs as well, right? Um, so something new that people are doing. So it still makes you look like you're doing something fancy, but um, you don't have those products around. Right. Uh, some other things going on. We have the Office of War Information. Right. This group is trying to support the war, so they're going to be making lots of posters, cartoons, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, there are tons of cartoons from uh, Bugs Bunny to Daffy Duck, um, all sorts of things like that. Um, I will definitely link several of those in the description down below for you guys to watch. All right. So definitely tell mom and dad I'm not just watching cartoons. It's for history class. Um, but some of the things that we are going to see in those are people trying to uh, have American citizens buy war bonds, all right, to help pay for the war. And obviously lots of propaganda happening. All right. And again, this propaganda is to get people to support the war. Um, this is one of my favorite posters over here. And so it's the idea of quiet, know your place, shut your face. The idea that if you know information, you don't want to speak it out loud because you don't know who is listening because there could be spies amongst us. Right. Um, the economy is definitely coming out of that uh, out of that Great Depression. All right. And we're seeing that a lot, especially in the Sun Belt where we are living here in the South. Right. And so some of the places we're going to start building are locally. We know where Lockheed Martin Air Force Base is. It is here in Marietta, right? And so that's going to be built, and they're going to be making lots of airplanes there. Now, with this particular plant, they want to make sure it is safe, so they put camouflage on it. So this is what the actual buildings look like, and then this is this camouflage tent that goes over top of it that makes it look like from the air um, like it's some sort of... A suburb or something like that um, and doesn't look like it's an airplane airplane factory um, so really crazy but interesting stuff right uh, changes socially right we're going to talk about women African Americans and Japanese Americans right so for women uh, women are working in all the factories at this particular time period right and so we have Rosie the Riveter is going to be kind of the um, the spokesperson or uh, model, if you will, for women workers during the war. Um, we even have Miss Beeman's little girl dressed up as Rosie for Halloween this year, right? Um, and so six million uh, married women are working in these factories. Um, a lot of these women will leave the factories after the war is over, but not everyone. So again, a major change in the role of women. Right. For African Americans, this is one of the sections in your guys' uh, web quest that is with the Double V campaign and A. Philip Randolph. All right, so Double V, V means victory, right? So he wants victory uh, against the 
um, fascist in the war and he wants victory against discrimination at home, right? And so for this guy, A. Philip Randolph, he's going to be threatening a march on Washington. FDR wants to make sure that we're supporting the war, but he also wants to help out with um, African Americans as well. So he's kind of trying to have this nice balance in between. He will end up passing a law that is allowing fair hiring practices for government jobs. Um, we are going to see increased membership in the NAACP and in a new group, CORE, which is the Congress of Racial Equality. Both of these groups still exist today. Okay. And our last topic here is the internment camps. Now, of all the things that we did during World War II, we, you know, we're the United States, right? we're, we do a lot of great things, but we also do a lot of bad things, just like everyone else, right? We made decisions that we thought were good at the time, but ended up being really, really horrible decisions. So after Pearl Harbor, Har Pearl Harbor, a lot of people are scared of the Japanese because they feel that Japanese are going to be spies in the United States um, and have another attack on the U.S. Um, and so the United States ends up having these internment camps. Now, the internment camps, or should we use the words concentration camps, um, they're, it's, they're both kind of the same thing. The only thing we didn't do is that we we treated these people horribly, but we didn't kill them or anything like that. Um, but we did some really, really horrible things. Um, I will include uh, some links to some podcasts that are about stories of the internment camps if you are interested to get a little bit more detail because it is something that I feel like we need to make sure that we know a lot about so we do not ever repeat it um, in the future. Um, but it was basically the idea that people were scared. And when people are scared, they tend to make poor decisions. Um, German Americans and some Italian Americans, some of them are going to be put into these internment camps, but very, very low, low percentages um, compared to Japanese Americans. Um, most of German and Italian Americans had been in the United States for a very, very long time. Um, and so you will see some discrimination here and there, but not not nearly to anything that we're going to see with the Japanese Americans. Now, these internment camps, if we look at this map down here at the bottom, are all across the United States, right? So we do have one that is here in Georgia. Um, so there are going to be people of um, anyone who has any Japanese ancestry will be sent to these camps. So even if you were a child um, who was adopted by, um, like, by white American parents, you were taken to the camps. Um, and so... Um, extremely, extremely horrible, horrible things. Um, and so again, I'm going to put some descriptions, uh, stuff in the descriptions down below to, uh, give you guys a little bit more information on that, because again, this is something if we were in class, we would definitely spend, um, quite a bit of time discussing what's going on, looking at primary sources from different people who, uh, were in the camps and things like that. Um, so here's where we're going to end our notes for today. Um, definitely make sure that you are looking through these and you are doing your web quest um, and also working on your packet for this unit if you're in the honors class. Right? Um, all those due dates are on the blog. If you have questions, definitely send me those questions and I'll try to help you guys out as soon and quickly as I can. Bye-bye.